Hi, I'm Ben. And I'm Lucas. And we are two aspiring filmmakers making unnecessary commentary on famous movies. Each week, we will randomly select a film to analyze, discuss, and review. We will select the film at the end of each podcast, so you will have ample time to watch the movie before the next episode. We are slightly qualified film students. Okay. Hello. We are back at it. Slightly qualified film students. This week, we're reviewing Richard Linklater's literal coming-of-age movie, uh, Boyhood. Literal coming of age movie. Yeah, it's literally a coming of age. You are you literally watch... watching a boy come of age in front of your eyes. Yeah, I forget. I ju- already forgot the main actor's name. Uh, Brilliant. Yeah, uh, but you watch him from when he's in grade one to when he goes off to university. Everything in between. Although, like, I, I think a good half of the movie is like later in his life yeah um they kind of skim through the earlier years a bit you know because yeah it's not as exciting this movie started Um, production in 2000 and it ended production in 2012 and then it was in post-production and came out in 2014 um so it was a 14 year mm. journey making this movie um right which is probably one of the longest uh production of a film ever <laughs> yeah at least for a mainstream ish film yeah because i mean this film was up for a lot of oscars it was up for best picture up for all that stuff although it was in birdman's use Lost i don't think birdman. it won anything um um yeah 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 it's a really cool uh, it's an awesome concept you know richard linklater uh legendary director of school of rock and also these little things called the Before Trilogy. I don't know. I don't really know. They're they're kind of small, you know. Yeah. Not many people know about them. It's like School of Rock, you know. <laughs> School of Rock is like his undisputed masterpiece. You know? <laughs> School of I Rock. I think everything else he's done is just kind of... I bought School of Rock on DVD. <laughs> School of Rock is actually so fire. I've probably seen it like ten times. I used to watch it all the time as a kid. Yeah, Boyhood only won one Oscar, which was Best Supporting oh, really? Actress... Patricia Arquette won. Really? Yeah. Uh, uh, and it was nominated for Best Picture, Best Supporting Actor, Ethan Hawke, Best Directing, Best Screenplay. Wait, wait she, was in a, she was in Bringing Out the Dead. Patricia Arquette's that, uh, a huge that Nicola... actor. She's like... No, I know, but she was in the Martin Scorsese movie with uh, Nicolas Cage. Oh, yeah? Yeah. yeah. So there you go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. She's won... She won uh, literally everything in the act. She's in True Romance, bro. She's the uh, lead actress in True uh, Romance. Um, yeah. Uh, but, you know, this film, a big part of it is, like, you're watching uh, our main character, Simon. That's his name. No, Mason. Mason, grow up. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah. you're also seeing everyone else grow up. You get to see Patricia Arquette and Ethan Hawke go from, like, you know, in their, like, 30s Dude, to... Dude, Ethan... Ethan Hawke looks so young at the yeah, start of this movie. I know. He looks like a college kid. I mean, that's Ethan Hawke in his prime at the start of the movie. And then... Really? He, well, sort of. 2000? If you think about it. I mean, yeah. Ethan Hawke. So he's 50 now. Yeah, so he would have been yeah, like 30. Yeah, he literally would have been 30 mm-hmm. when they started. Yeah. And then he would have been Damn. like 43, 42. When the movie ended. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, I mean, you get to see them grow up. You get to see the sister. Actually, you get to see anyone that has a repeated role in this movie are all the same actors. Even, like, the yeah. the plumber who uh, oh, we see God, at the restaurant dude. at the end. Richard Linklater is a goat, but that was so <laughs> stupid. I was like, What? <laughs> They were just, uh, <laughs> they were trying to show off yes. that they could get the same actor six years later. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's just so, like, I don't know. I thought that was kind of stupid. <laughs> like, hey, you actually changed my life, and now look at me. I'm the manager of this restaurant. <laughs> Lunch is on me. <laughs> like, you should listen to your mother. I was like, oh, God, dude. <laughs> that, that could have been cut. Like whatever respect and they like made him better at english too yeah <laughs> that's cool 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, no. It's it's a cool concept, executed super well. Going in, I was kind of like, uh, I'm not going to like this very much because it's long. <laughs> and also, I don't know. I, I don't even know why I was, like, not expecting to be wowed. But then I was like, you know what? This is actually really good. Um, it's not, like, the most beautiful film I've ever seen, but it's really well written. An amazing concept. I mean, it's just super unique uh and it's like aside from some cringy acting i feel like it's a pretty good uh it's like the perfect coming of age movie in a sense i don't think it's the best one but like you get to see so much of mason's life and all these different events that are shaping him and you actually get to see it in the same actor so i think that it's just like incredible that they're able to do that i mean i think it's one of the Um, most relatable films i've seen ever yeah like the amount of relatability to this because roughly we've grown up in pretty much the same time as we're watching this film this film's a tiny bit earlier but it's pretty much it's a tiny bit earlier but i can relate to most like a lot of the phases he goes through like i I, we all went through a lot of these phases he has like a Star mm-hmm. Wars phase. He has a Harry Potter phase. He goes through, and you're you're constantly getting all of these like big political or uh, pop cultural references that are very um, in the time when they actually shot that. Like, um, yeah, dude. It starts with the Iraq War, and then you have Obama being elected, the Dark Knight coming out, uh, Twilight, that somebody that i used to know song <laughs> playing at the bar yeah like it's and all these no, things and, oh what does he say what does he say his favorite movies are in 2008 he says pineapple express yeah the tropic thunder tropic and, and the, the dark, dark night. night yeah and i would just like to say you got amazing taste my boy <laughs> you got amazing taste um it's fantastic it's insane how relatable this film is like and the thing about this movie that's so weird is that there isn't really any major conflicts throughout the movie. I mean, there's a little bit here and there, yeah. but it's mostly just like you're getting these 20 minute snippets of life as he ages and you're just kind of watching him go from year to year. Yeah. Um, and it was, I mean, there's minor problems, but it, it, I think part of the relatability is that it's not, you know, often in film, even if it's a super relatable high school movie, they're still following that typical plot structure where they're going to have this big problem that needs solving. Yeah. And then, you know, the climax, all that stuff. Whereas this just feels like what would actually happen in real life. Like, yes, there are problems, but it's not... They're not life One big thing. Yeah, there's not one huge yeah. overarching they're problem. They're just like real to... life problems. Exactly. Um, and I... And yeah, like... like I first watched this movie... I've only... Seen, this is the second time watching this, but the first time I watched this, I was, uh, like, grade six, probably. Like, this was... Whoa! When it had... I think it was, like, a year after it came out, I watched it. So, it's interesting mm-hmm. now rewatching it, because the first time I watched it, I was, like, the age he is near the start of the movie. And then now watching it being pretty much where he was at the end of the movie... And it's interesting hmm. upon rewatch, seeing it in a completely different way, catching a lot of stuff I definitely didn't catch on first watch. Um, yeah, so it was very cool to rewatch this. Huh. Yeah. I think, uh, like, a lot of this stuff feels fairly accurate in life. Um, I think that Ethan Hawke's dad character is just like an absolute homie the coolest dad ever um the best yeah coolest dad ethan hawk and richard linklater are just like they are a match made in heaven Mm -hmm. yeah uh yeah and i think that you get to it's cool that you get to watch mason uh you know i was gonna say watch him become a slightly better actor but that's not really true they, they, you know, they had to gamble on this kid when he was, like, yeah. six. Yeah. And they, you know, they could have picked someone else. I think... It's a it's it's a hard decision, he's, I guess. He's, he's fine. Honestly, he's, he's, he's okay. Especially... He's okay. When he was really young, like, it's, like, good. 
He Honestly, was literally I, better when I don't he was think a his kid. acting but, ever was that bad. I think it's more his friends and stuff that were just like sometimes unbearable. I, I mean, thought he like kept that a scene where they're driving in the him and his girlfriend are driving in the truck and he's like talking about how humans are cyborgs. I was just like, damn, yo, <laughs> this kid is kind of cringy. <laughs> but like it it's just like not the level of acting. Yeah. That should be in a feature film. Yeah, that's very true. It's it's just, like, not on par. <laughs> well, the other thing is, is, like, most coming-of-age movies, they got, like... Like, Waves is a movie that Lucas and I both really like. Yeah. And the actors who are playing high school kids there are both in their mid to late 20s. Yeah, where this film, they're With, actually, he's actually the age of the character. Exactly. Yeah. And he's... Literally, his acting experience is this movie, whereas Waves, you have actual... Like experienced Lucas professional Hedges. actors mr lucas Hedges, like 28 character. playing a <laughs> eight, yeah eight, lucas Hedges year old. is a goddamn legend yeah. i love lucas what yeah. a god um yeah okay let's do some standout scenes here what is your standout scene for sure uh you know there's no like like we were talking about there's no problem there's no like big climax so i just picked like a really funny scene to me and that was the actually forget where they are i think they're at a restaurant or something but it's a safe sex talk that ethan Hawk <laughs> gives his daughter and his son because i just thought it was hilarious and like yeah it's just like so funny and like so relatable <laughs> just the awkwardness of both the dad and the uh the daughter yeah and then like the little li- little uh whatever mason is just like (laughs) yeah like that scene was just hilarious i really liked it and also the sarah palin joke is hilarious yeah yeah Yeah. love that scene um there were only three scenes i remembered in this movie going into it the beginning the ending and this really random scene that i have no clue why it stuck in my brain and it's literally a 30 second shot of uh, Ethan Hawke and the two kids, Mason and his sister, playing, like, hide-and-go-seek around a statue. I don't know why yeah. I remembered that scene. It was, like, the only thing that I remembered from this film besides the beginning and ending. But I gotta say, upon rewatch, I think it's the cutest, sweetest scene in the entire movie. It's, like, it captures just, like, this complete innocence in life. This is, like, the second year as we're going through all of the years. And they're just, like, playing around in a field. And there's just this long, wide shot, kind of, like, pulling back, dolly back, of them playing hide-and-go-seek around, like, a statue. Cool. Awesome. I love that scene. My other favorite scene, which is more of a scene, not a shot, um, is when Ethan Hawke goes camping with Mason. It's Mm -hmm. just... Which also features some of the worst voiceover I've ever seen. Where? Uh, I did not catch it. That scene at the lake is so obviously dubbed. Really? When swimming. Because <laughs> it's shot from behind them and their lips just, like, don't match up. And That's then it, funny. like, hilariously cuts out when he jumps in the water. That's funny. No, I like yeah. the part not after the lake where they're sitting at the campfire yeah. and they're talking about Star Wars. And I... Thought yeah, that was so. And they funny. predicted. They literally like <laughs> predicted how Star Wars was gonna go. This would like they can't shot... make another movie yeah, no. now because the Jedi are all like gone, right? <laughs> and they're, and like, they're like, what are yeah, they gonna do? They make Princess could, like, Leia make Han sick? Solo. Yeah, they're gonna kill yeah. Han Solo. And then, <laughs> and yeah, and then like it ha- And Disney was watching that, and they were like, "Hey, no!" But the funny thing that's is, that's not a bad idea. They, this movie came out <laughs> right before the Force Awakens came out. Like, right before. Well, wait, was The Force Awakens really 2015? Or maybe The Force Awakens was 2015. But it's still, it came out... Yeah, it was. The Force Awakens would have been far into production at this point. Um, yeah. And they would have but shot But, I mean, when they this, were talking about it... would have been, like, 2005 <laughs> when, they, when they shot that uh, yeah. scene. So, uh, I just thought that was hilarious upon retrospect and watching it. Um, mm-hmm. Because that that feels like a conversation you would have actually had. And then the actual pop culture references. I don't know. There's a lot of stuff in this film that are just, like, funny because it's all related to, like, present day. And it's actually, they're in the real world. 
they're not in a made up world, so right. everything is just relatable. Yeah. 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 Um, okay, well, let's take a quick break and then we will hop into the actual review. <laughs> Okay, we are back, hopping in to story and originality at a 10%. Yes. Um, yeah, I think that in terms of originality, in terms of story, this film is just pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, to, to take the coming of age genre and really just like, just like, be like, all right, all right, I've had enough of these fake high school movies, I'm gonna make like this epic where you actually follow a kid from six to 18 like Richard Linklater man I don't know how you thought of that or how you thought that was going to be a good idea uh but it was a good idea and it's one of the most unique films I've ever seen uh it doesn't feel gimmicky at all you know it doesn't feel like they're just doing that to sell tickets you know like they're not just oh look we made this movie and we actually followed the kid as so that it has something to sell it's it's just actually such a genuine story and such a great concept and i absolutely was like damn respect yeah madly original uh i mean he he's done this before with the before trilogy sort of with them each being like a decade away from each other so you're watching like Mm-hmm. Ethan Hawke again grow up but um I mean this is like it's just it's a beautiful story and it's it's realism as most Linklater films are they're based in reality they're kind of just like real life relatable films that don't really do much don't really have much to say but also say a lot just in the the realism of it all it's very original um mm-hmm. yeah i mean honestly there's no other film that's really done this and the courage to go to a production company and be like yeah 14 year production give me money which i don't really think happened i think he had to fund a lot of this out of his own pocket um and then he got right a production company onto it when it was pretty much done but like i mean school of rock would have made him bank yeah, bro definitely not gonna lie. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, story and originality, this is an easy 10 out of 10. It's a beautiful story, and the originality marks are off the top, off the charts here. Yeah, I, I also had to give it full marks. I mean, just the sheer balls to make a movie like this is like miles above other stuff we've reviewed. I don't think that it has the most complicated story. Like, you know, if we're looking at it purely on a story perspective, it's still really good. But like, I mean, it's just, it's an amazing concept executed super well. Uh, yeah. Beginning out of five. This movie has like yeah. my favorite opening shot. <laughs> what of yeah. him laying? I just, in the... I don't know. It gives me chills every time. And it's like cold plays yellow, just like comes on and the drums hit, and then his, you know, Mister. Was yellow even released when this movie started? I, I think yellow was. I don't know, but that song is a banger, and it just like comes on, and then you just cuts to yeah, that. Yeah, it came out in two thousand. Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah, dude. I wonder if they actually. I think they d- thought like they timed the songs to the dis- year. I think. Well, kinda. I mean, they're into old yeah, music. Yeah, yeah. But like the. But you you hear Soldier yeah. Boy when when that was a thing. Yeah. They use some. I mean, Yellow yeah, is yeah. a banger, and then you just see that wide pan up shot of him laying in the grass, looking at the clouds. It is a beautiful opening shot. I love it. Gives me chills. It's mm-hmm. like one of my favorite shots. Yeah, man. Yeah, uh, I think. Overall, w- super well shot beginning. Uh, great setup for this this little kid. Um, I think it's you know where do they wait? I don't even know where they live originally, uh, but just the vibes of him playing with his little friends. I don't know how he got into spray painting and graffiti at <laughs> age like six, 
but you know that's fine uh overall super good beginning yeah. uh not really anything to take it to the top but like overall really yeah good, solid good four game. out of five uh i love the scenes yeah. of him and his sister just like yelling at each other and then their mom yelling at them and just constant chaotic yelling it's very relatable <laughs> mm-hmm. i feel like that's every childhood house lots of just screaming Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, next up, we got the ending. I love this ending. I thought it was super good at the the big yeah bend beautiful state location park or whatever. But the acting was kind of cringe. So I was like, "Damn, that last line where she's like, memories or moments sees you not or like not the other way around or." Yeah, no, no, no. People say yeah. she's the moment, but I think it's the other way but around. I, I was like, I yeah. also thought that was so funny because I'm like, this is so true. College kids are so pretentious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I I don't know. I I love this. I think I, this I ending was... is beautiful, beautiful, beautiful ending. Um, it's just such yeah. a honest way to end the film. It's like he goes to college, and he's just gonna sit in this like beautiful location and get high (laughs) like that's that's the ending um exactly i i I don't know it's really heartwarming and it 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 Uh feels like it comes full circle even though it doesn't it's like it's just his life it leaves the mom character in the middle of the midlife crisis just and it's just it's yeah it's life i mean technically her his mom was in a crisis at the start of the movie so i guess it kind of went full circle um you know it's a beautiful ending uh i agree with you though the acting is pretty mediocre actually it's a little less than mediocre i give it a solid four out of five though it's a really just nice i gave it a solid four out of five too i just took one point off for the kind of cringy acting Honestly, the girl is fine. It's just, it's just him. <laughs> Eller, uh, oh Coltrane. God, Eller, Eller Coltrane. He just, he just he's kind of robotic. He just didn't end up <laughs> in a, yeah, he just feels very one dimensional. Yeah. Like he may have been, might have been good as a kid, but then just like maybe got disinterested, but he had already like signed a contract <laughs> or something. It's I like was thinking about that. I was like, what, ha- what would you do? No, but like, what would you do if like Ethan Hawke like died halfway through production? <laughs> they would have to write off it. They would have like, to what? kill off the character, I guess. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Like, That's very true. I'm amazed that they even got anybody to come back. Especially Richard Linklater's daughter. I feel like she... <laughs> I feel like he's so forced. Can you imagine he like made his daughter <laughs> sign a contract? <laughs> she has to come back. No, nah, I bet I bet he was literally just like, yo, you have to. You literally have to be in it. You're the perfect age to be this character's older sister, even though you guys look nothing alike. <laughs> That's true. Um, no one looks anything alike. Honestly, family, I but, think she's know, the it's... best child act. Well, not child, but like, yeah, child actor that grows into a adult. I yeah, think she's I thought strongest. she was good too because she's not she's not robotic. She feels like yeah. an actual awkward. And you know, Richard Linklater was coaching her at home, being like, "Oh, exactly." Sure. Has she even been in anything else? I don't think so. Probably. <laughs> she's probably just done with acting now. It's like never again. Yeah, she was like, <laughs> "Nah, nope." Um, done with that. Yeah. Okay. Screenplay. Yeah, okay. Dialogue. Screenplay and dialogue. I mean. I mean, I mean, it's Richard Linklater. I mean, Richard Linklater, kind of the goat, and I haven't even seen the Before Trilogy. Uh, but I mean, School of Rock. <laughs> Dazed and Confused. <laughs> oh, I gotta watch that, too. Dude, it's, I feel like the when I looked at his early movie titles, like Slacker and Dazed and Confused, I was like, okay, this boyhood is deadass just what Richard Linklater was in college. <laughs> like, Richard Linklater was 100% just yeah. a stoner. Because his first two features are just about Matthew McConaughey being a lazy stoner. And that's stoner. how this movie ends. I was like, you know what? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I was like, yeah, no, Richard Linklater, I see what you're doing here, buddy. Um, 
Yeah, no. I think that dialogue, it's amazing. I mean, this screenplay, they wrote it, like, as it... He he didn't even have a complete script, because yeah. didn't he... He based it off of real-life real life yeah. experiences that him and the cast had during and it. And current events. So it was, like, an evolving script. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, Richard, you're just a goat, man. Now I gotta watch the Before Trilogy. Yeah, it's... Um, he yeah honestly i mean the before trilogy the dialogue is just next level dialogue it's like out of this world good um but this movie w- i don't think it would have worked if the dialogue wasn't good because yes i mean ethan hawk and patricia arquette are good actors but the rest of them are like pretty meh and if you don't mm-hmm. have good dialogue to keep it up all of a sudden, that acting... Because the acting's already bringing down the dialogue. If that dialogue isn't good to start with, it's just... It's going to completely fall flat. So that's why I, I think this film gets all these passes. Because the dialogue is so good that it's like... It doesn't even matter that the acting is bad. Because what they're saying is like, yeah, it's really good. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, for I give sure. it full marks. 8 out of 8, screenplay and dialogue. Yeah. I gave it a I gave it full marks too. Solid um 8%. It's it's not the best. It's not the best screenplay ever. But like the dialogue is just like so next level, bro. It's just so awesome. And I totally agree that the acting would have been that much worse if Richard wasn't out here with his pen just dropping yep. magical one-liners all over the place uh yeah so yeah we'll move into soundtrack now i mean okay there's too many classics in this soundtrack for it not to be full marks this soundtrack is so but like awesome. at the I same time it feels like they couldn't license some songs long enough to get lyrics like band on the run by wings <laughs> which is like an awesome song they play the opening instrumental but then they just stop it before Paul McCartney comes on, because I don't know. Like, I, I don't know. I love the soundtrack, but it just feels like they didn't have the budget to actually use the full songs. <laughs> yeah, but they captured, like, every genre. Yeah, I mean, her, his daughter lives Britney of... Spears. Yeah, you got Britney Spears, Coldplay, Blink-182, uh, John Lennon, The Beatles, uh, Vampire Weekend, Lady Gaga... Foo Fighters, um, Kings of Leon, like it, it's insane. And like, bro, that they even have Arcade I mean, we Fire. Got Arcade dude. Fire at the very, Arcade Fire closing off the film, closing off the film. But right before that is Hero by Family of the Year, which is like the song I connect to this movie because I don't know, it's just like him driving to college. Yeah, that song. And they got in the background. They got a Yola Tango song on there. All my. Alt homies love Yola Tengo, you already know. They also have right at the start one of my favorite songs. They got a uh, hate to ta- hate to say I told you so, which is a banger. But once again, I don't think they could license it long enough to fully come on. But like, dude, this soundtrack is just legendary. They even have flaming lips on here, bro. Like, yeah, Richard, man. I mean, okay, I already knew that his music taste was awesome from School of Rock, obviously. Uh, <laughs> but, like, I didn't know you like the exact same music I do, man, so respect. Yeah. Uh, 7 out of 7. No totally. doubt in my mind. I love totally. the soundtrack. It's an amazing. This is a soundtrack I would genuinely, like, buy on vinyl, because every song is a Dude, band. every song. Except, like, the rock remix of Crank That Soldier Boy. I don't know what that was, bro, <laughs> but I guess it fits the timeline, so you're good. You get a pass. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, production design, costumes, and set. Now, like, the set design in this film isn't incredible, but, like, what I'm giving points here for is the fact that, like, you just get to watch everybody's sense of style and fashion evolve with their years. Yeah. And, like, it doesn't feel... It feels very genuine. Like, all the different ear piercings, the different hairstyles. um, You know, at some point, his sister dyes her hair. They start dressing cooler. Whatever. They, uh... 
I love that it's evolving. I mean, it kind of has to, but it just feels super well done here. And a lot of this was like literally that's just the actors. Yeah. Like that was what they exactly. did. Like in the time cuz they filmed this movie like one month out of every year. So those other 11 months these actors were just doing whatever they wanted to do. Yeah. And then they would come back and it worked for this movie because there was no need for continuity cuz a year had passed. Um so it's very cool. Uh, I love Ethan Hawke's costumes. He's got some style, that man. What, just like movie. jeans and buttons? In like the weirdest way. <laughs> yeah, it's like the da- the most dad outfits. Dude, ever. I bet Ethan like Hawke is like a great awesome. father. Does he have kids? Yeah, with the, the girl in Stranger Things is his daughter. Uma Thurman and him. Oh, wow. Well, he's not married to Uma Thurman anymore. No. No, I think he cheated on her with the nanny. Wow, really? Uh, <laughs> Are you sure? Yeah. Bro. <laughs> Ethan Hawke, dude, what but, are you um... doing? <laughs> Was that before or after Kill Bill? <laughs> oh, I have no clue. But yeah, their their daughter is Maya Hawke, who is... She was in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood also. Right. Okay. Yep. Um... So, yeah, production design, I think it's pretty solid. I th- I actually like the set decoration in, like, their yeah, bedrooms yeah, and yeah. stuff. All the different posters they had up that really fit, well, I guess, we're saying it, like, fit the time, like, they had to, like, research what it was in the time period. Like, this was, li- they were just living through it. Yeah, they had to but, research um, it, bruh. It's just like an now. actual 16-year-old <laughs> kid telling Richard Linklater, like, at okay, I have this and... <laughs> Probably just grabbed stuff from his daughter's actual yeah, bedroom. Dude, I still think it's so <laughs> funny that he cast his own daughter. Like, that must have been so annoying for her. She's like, Dad, this summer I don't want to be on a film set for a month. And he's like, too bad. We're eight years deep. But also, it's like you get to say that once a month out of the year, Ethan Hawke becomes your dad. So, like, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, it's a subtle flex. Like... Oh, what did you do on your summer break? Oh, yeah. Ethan Hawke was my, like, my dad and stuff for a month. It's pretty cool. My dad for yeah. a month, yeah. Um, I gave it a 5% yeah. out of 6 for the production and Yeah, costumes. same. 5 out of 6. Location selection. Okay, location selection. I think that the location selection is, pr- is pretty awesome in this film. Uh, some beautiful locations here in Texas. Uh... They got, obviously, the National Park at the end, but also just, like, the lake where they go camping is a cool location. That art gallery where they are, or I don't even know what that is, where they were playing hide-and-seek. That's a cool location. This film is just stacked with dope locations, because, I mean, they had, like, a whole year to figure out where they were going to film each time. Uh, Yeah, and that final location. Yeah, yeah, this National Park. That final, yeah. Yeah, It's it's beautiful. I don't think it's the most beautiful but it's it's really solid location selection like there wasn't one location where i was like damn but for the most part but it's also like real because like that's exactly yeah Yeah. solid solid yeah uh i give it a solid five out of six i think it's pretty great yeah i gave it a five (laughs) percent out of six too really good uh, we'll take a quick break and then we'll hop into the second half of the review. Yeah. Okay. All right. We are back. Back. Cinematography. Hopping into time. cinematography. Yeah. I uh, I like the look of this film. They're going for a very uh, you know, like chill laid back vibe uh there's some absolutely beautiful shots when there needs to be when things are getting romantic get a nice depth of field especially when him and his girlfriend uh sheena i think her name was Mm -hmm. especially during that kind of part of his life there's some nice depth of field uh but for the most part it's fairly basic which i like it fits the like laid back vibe of the story yeah uh, but, you know, it's not the most beautiful film I've ever seen. Yeah, no. I mean, Linklater doesn't usually have the most uh, beautiful-looking films. His films are more just, like, realism. 
a lot of wide shots. Yeah. A lot of just like Yeah. Letting the actors do their stuff. There there's one shot which I was like, damn, that takes guts. Cause it was like him and his uh I guess it would have been his girlfriend, yeah. But they were like young. This was when they were I don't know, probably twelve or something. And they're riding on bikes. And it's one take that's about like eight minutes or no, it's probably like six minutes long where they're just biking and the camera just tracks them and they're having an entire conversation. And I was like, that wasn't like six minutes. It was long, was it? bro. They go down like five blocks. Like I was sitting there and was like, damn, you, you, you trusted 12 year olds to do that. Like, yeah, I get that. They're like, dude, I'm so disillusioned. To long shots now after I watched this film Climax last week, dude. Yeah. So crazy. I want to watch that. Dude, it's literally so... Like, what did I just watch? Like... <laughs> I mean... Oh my god, dude. It's, that's it's Richard so Linklater's weird. style. Like, if you watch the Before Trilogy, like, every scene is one take right. because he's just letting the actors do their thing. But it's hard to do right, that yeah. here with young actors. He does it, mm-hmm. but I like that he still does it a couple times because, uh, you know, those I love a good long take. I I just I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I I uh, I gave cinematography an eight percent out of ten, because I still really like some of the shots in this film. It's still yeah super good looking film. I also gave it an eight out of ten. Uh yeah. Well, let's move on to editing. Editing. Um, uh, I think that this film is very solidly edited. There were some voiceovers that, like I said, were kind of obvious. Um, like, especially in at the, some wide shots, you could just tell that their voices were not lining up. But I think overall... Editing wise, it's super good. Like you're saying that there are a lot of long wide shots. Uh so you know, this this film isn't edited to a T like some more modern, crazy stylistic films. But like it still has super solid pacing and all that. Uh overall, very solid editing. No real noticeable errors at all. I mean, so. the most impressive thing about the editing here is that they edited twelve years together. Like yeah, yeah, no. I mean, this was a long I mean, post-production. I think, I, I think it was two year. I read that it's it's forty five days of total shooting, which, if you think about it, is actually a lot less than I would have expected for twelve years. Yeah, but but um, still, you gotta sort through it and make it all look like it's like the same quality. <laughs> but it is like, cool. I was, like I forgot to say this in cinematography, but how it like the cinematography gets better every year yeah it's weird though like i was thinking about that before i was gonna watch it i was like uh, am i literally gonna watch it go from 1080p to 4k or something it does Um, it literally (laughs) it literally does like the like those last shots of the national park i was like yo this is like (laughs) definitely a higher quality camera than when they first started i i'm pretty sure they switched from film to digital like halfway through the film like Perhaps, yeah, maybe. But it's kind of cool because it's also representing, like, technology growth throughout the years. I don't know. There, There's a lot of elements to this film that's really awesome. I think the editing is actually really great. I think there's some awesome transitions from um, the different times, which is hard to do if you're planning it out a year in advance. Um, mm-hmm. Like, just, like, where it cuts from. Like, she... Uh, she meets the college professor and then it cuts to them like coming back from their honeymoon and it's a year later like little stuff like that um, I don't know I, I was impressed by the editing here I just think that's a big thing to do to edit all this stuff together and try and make it seem cohesive and work as one story even though you're, you're yeah. just splicing together different little stories from Especially years. when they are like changing the script every two, yeah, um, like every year, yeah. So, yeah, uh, I give it a seven yeah. out of eight. I give it a seven out of eight for editing. 
I gave it a 6%. I wasn't taking that into account as much as I guess you did. Uh, but I can see that. Yeah. I can see that. Uh, solid 6, though. Let's go on to acting at a 10%. Yeah, well... <laughs> uh, uh, like, it's... It's... it's. I think there there are definitely good. the moments here where it's the worst acted... Worst acting we've seen so far on this podcast. Um, yeah. It's it's just like... It's, it's hard, though, because every other film that is on our wheel are professional actors with years of experience. Like... It's hard to cast a six-year-old and yeah, know whether or not he's even going to be interested in acting when he's a teenager. Yeah, totally. um, It's just, like, uh, he he's an okay actor. I, I, I don't know. Uh, the acting just isn't the best yeah. in this film. Ethan Hawke I think saves it's a it. <laughs> real, oh, yeah. E- Ethan Hawke gives an incredible performance. I really didn't expect Patricia... Um. To to get all those nominations, yeah. Uh, Patricia Arquette won it. To be honest, I thought at some points her acting was not good. Um, either, but you know, I I think in general the acting is, it's 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 a good. Yeah. Some of the side characters though feel pretty. Like, how c- couldn't you have just hired a real actor for this part? Like, Lucas yeah. and I, before the podcast, were talking about the the uh, the sleepover at the the camp at the old house scene yeah. with the two seniors. And it's like, those guys are aren't so bad. The, the seniors? So bad. Like, and so his bad. And their brother. Everybody except Eller, yeah. whatever, are bad. Mm. Honestly, no, no, no. That, that one kid who's like, nah, man, I don't want to... Drink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he was pretty good. But, like, the seniors uh, are, like, trying... Like, they're trying to be the most stereotypical, like, douchebag grade 12s ever. But the dialogue isn't, like, supporting that. The dialogue, yeah, they're they're kind of jerks, but they're, they're just, like, you know, kind of making fun of them. Like, these guys were, like, yo! Like, trying to be so over-the-top fake. It was really bad. They needed some direction here. Um, yeah, and it's just like, I don't, I don't know, man. Like you could have just hired real actors for that part. Yeah. <laughs> like you could have just yeah. hired some real, some real actors. Um, I don't know. But I do like Richard Linklater's I daughter. I think she gives a good performance throughout this entire movie. Um, like. N- no, actually, I think it's a pretty good performance throughout the entire movie. I think she grows as an actor, and I think she actually does a pretty good job. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, totally. Um, Ethan Hawke is awesome. I love every scene that Ethan Hawke is in. I cherish every scene that he is in. Um, mm-hmm. And I think Patricia Arquette's pretty good. I agree with you. I don't think Patricia Arquette was Oscar-winning worthy in this film. But I also Not think that she close. has her moments where she does play this like single mother kind of perfectly well like what 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 else what was that the 2014 oscars i mean that year was stacked dude you could have given supporting actress to uh to, to i like, would have given it to emma stone to, to, to emma Birdman. stone to emma stone um, or i mean the grand budapest you can't give it to till this one didn't she saoirse ronan pretty soon I mean, she's not in it for I that guess much, so. Though. I definitely would have given it to Emma Stone for Birdman. That, like, monologue she gives to That's Michael like, Keaton. Infinitely better. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Gone Girl came out that year, too. Interstellar. Gone Girl doesn't I mean, really have a sporting actress. Interstellar, nah. I would not give it to Anne Hathaway. Um, no. You could give it to the boss in Nightcrawler. The news boss. Eh, yeah, yeah, she's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know. It just wasn't that great of a performance to me. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, I was being generous, though. Like, I don't know. It was hard for me because, like, I haven't seen acting this this bad in my <laughs> movie we've done. So I didn't know what to give it. Uh, uh, yeah. But, like, since I thought it overall took away from the viewing experience at some points, I gave it a 6%. I gave it a 6% out of 10. 
it's still a pass. You yeah. Know, it's above 50%. Yeah. But I was like, there are some scenes that are just, like, honestly could have been... Like, this movie could have been, like, flawless. Yeah. With some really good actors. But, like, the acting is just the only thing dragging it down. Yeah. Uh, I give it a 7. Um, probably yeah, because, I, I, um, I don't know. I was prepared for the dad acting this time. I was prepared for it. Right. Um. I, I don't know. It's and just like... I love Ethan Hawke too much. But, 7 out mm-hmm. of 10. Still, it's a low 7. Definitely a low 7. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, entertainment value. Yeah, it's, it's... Entertainment This value. is an interesting one. Yeah. Because going in, the main thing that it's I was worried long. about, I was like, yo, this movie is so long. It's going to not be entertaining at all. But then I was just like... But bro, you can't judge a... long movies now that you've seen Magnolia. You can't judge long movies. No, I don't even... It's not even... Like, I like some long movies. Yeah. I, I like long movies. But just like long coming of age movies. I was like... <laughs> eh, I don't know. We'll see. But then it surprised me, man. Like, this movie is thoroughly entertaining, I thought. I really wasn't bored. It just was so relatable yeah. that every scene... I was I was in it, man. I watched it all the way through. Wasn't bored. I'm not going to rewatch it for a while, but, you know, I was pleasantly surprised with its entertainment value. Yeah. With that being said, it's, it's still, like, it's, it's still very long, (laughs) and there's still, because of its, uh, I don't know, because the, because of the fact that it's very, like, slice of life, it doesn't have a major problem, like, it's just not quite as like exciting <laughs> as other movies i don't know how to put it it's like yeah it's definitely not it's exciting. a really cool experience yeah. it's a really cool experience but it's not it's just it's, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know i find this movie very entertaining <laughs> uh yeah upon it's, my it's rewatch i think i don't know there's something about it like watching it now and being like yeah like i've lived that life i've lived through this it's very relatable yeah. and i was in it the whole time i actually i don't know i adore this movie on like a just a nostalgia value i don't even think this movie is like that great <laughs> like i i just love it for what it is i mean yeah the acting isn't great on a technical level it isn't stellar i mean it's solid but there isn't anything amazing either but there's just something about this movie that's just so sweet and just, like, heartwarming that I just, I love it. Mm-hmm. Um, I give it a 9 out of 10. I actually really enjoyed watching this movie. Yeah, I, I was leaning towards 9, but I ended up giving it an 8%. It's a high 8. Uh, but, like, yeah, I don't know. I really enjoyed it. I really did. It's just... Like, I don't know. What are some other movies I gave nines? Like, I gave, like, You Were Never Really Here a nine. I'm per- pretty sure. Hmm. I don't know. It's just, it's not, like, as entertaining as that movie. But it was a solid watch. I really, mm-hmm. really enjoyed it. So, yeah. yeah. Overall technical achievement out of 15. I think overall, very, very solid technically. Yeah. Um, yeah. Nothing nothing really stood out to me as crazy in terms of technicality, but uh, I think overall it's a it's a very, very solid movie on a technical standpoint. Yeah, it's solid throughout. I guess um, for, from the sounds of it, Richard Linklater isn't, like, the most cinematography-based yeah, director no. in the first place. He so. is yeah. story. Um, yeah. I, yeah. I think it's a solid technical achievement. Editing's bringing it up a bit for me. Soundtrack is awesome. I gave it a solid 13 out of 15. Yeah, I gave it a 13 too. So, that concludes the uh, the review. We'll tally up our final scores. We're going to do something fun also. Okay. okay, we are back. We have our total percentages tallied up here. Um, ben, what did you give Boyhood? 
See, I really loved this film, but I feel like the acting made my score a lot lower than I would like it to be. Uh, but Ooh. as it, as it stands, I gave Bullhead an eighty four percent. Eighty four percent. The Ooh, acting, just, the acting, just like me and Parasite. The yeah. acting took a chunk out of it. Like, uh, yeah. I still really love this movie though. Like I gave it full marks in so many things, but the acting really just like <laughs> dropped. Yeah, it. definitely. Uh, I gave Boyhood an eighty seven percent. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. This this movie really has good. a little piece of my I, heart. I, lo- I loved it. And it's a good movie. It's just yeah. the acting, bro. It's just, I wish it didn't. <laughs> Very true. I wish it wasn't the way it was. Uh, yeah, yeah, so that averages out to 85.5% if my math skills don't fail me. Does it tie with anything? It does, with Inside Lou and Davis. And I love Inside mm. Lou and Davis. But this movie is objectively better. Yeah, I like Boyhood better. I think a lot of greatest movies of all time lists would disagree with us weirdly. Yeah, I. you know what, though? I really like Inside Lou and Davis. I really do. I do, too. But I don't like it as much as everyone else hypes it, it up it's to like, be. N- a, it's like a mid-tier Coen Brothers film. It's just such a, like, nothing really happens film. Yeah, and it's like a nice (laughs) vibe. I like the cinema. I like the look. I like the soundtrack. But, like, it's not amazing. It's not amazing. Um, yeah. So, Boyhood comes in 15th place, just underneath Raging Bull. Hell Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Look at that. Um, Solid spot. Okay, so... Yeah. Well, first and f- first and foremost, we're going to spin the wheel and see what we're doing next week. But after we do that, we are going to start a little thing called Lucas and Ben's Top 100 Movies of All Time. Yes. Now, <laughs> uh, Ben and I have, as the great film nerds we are, obviously have letterboxed accounts. Of course. Where we rank movies and have great lists. That Yes we have done mm-hmm. ben has a top 100 list i have a top 300 list but i will be only talking about my top 100 no one wants to hear um, what the difference between 226 and 225 is bro <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> but it's starting to get more defined as i'm watching more movies Fair enough. Man. it's starting Dude, my to get top 100 defined. is like um, so solid at this point like i'm yeah, it's, mine too. It's mine too. My top one hundred, I'm very happy with. Yeah. So basically, yeah, Ben and I are gonna give out uh ten, uh each week starting with one hundred, and this will get posted on our Instagram s underscore q underscore f underscore s. Um, you will see, uh, a still of our favorite shot from the movie and the movie title and the placement, um, and we are gonna be doing this every week until we get down to number one, um. But yeah, let's spin the wheel first and see what we get, and then we're gonna we're gonna do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as for what we land on, I'm still hoping we land on Fear and Loathing because I really want to rewatch that movie. <laughs> Dude, I want to land on something I can watch on DVD because I got all these DVDs now. Boy, I just want to pull you... one out. Right. Okay. So something you've seen before, but maybe not in a while. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or actually, I have a couple DVDs I haven't seen. Like what? Weirdly. That I just, like, were like, these are good deals. Right. Um, yeah. But, okay. Let's see. Let's spin this wheel. What are we going to get? Here we go. Three, two. Oh, wait. Quick time player. I got to record this. Hold yeah, up. Yeah, quick time yeah, player. Yeah. You need proof or it didn't happen. Screen recording. Here we go. Okay. Now let's do it. And we are spinning in three, two, one. Oh, here we go. What are we going to land on? I don't know. I don't know. Oh. Oh. We have landed on the Grand Budapest Hotel. Oh. Oh. You know, this is funny because Lucas and I are talking about this. Like, on every single... Like a long time ago. Every single category on our ranking sheet. 
is like yeah. like the Grand Budapest Hotel is just like such a yeah. well-rounded movie. Like yep. I think beginning yep. Yep. beginning is gonna be low, because it's kind of that's the like beginning is the like okay I haven't seen Grand Budapest in a really long I've time. Se- I haven't like, seen it eight. since grade ten, so like it's been a year and a half. I've only seen this yeah, film. I once. watched this thing. Uh, s- but it's really? it's still wow. I won't spoil it because we're we're doing our top 100 list. I'll tell yeah, you this yeah, much. Yeah. I gave it a five stars because I really love it. I gave it a four and a half. Um, it's, just, it's Wes Anderson's like... Hey, I have this on DVD. I have this <gasps> on DVD, man. Let's go. I can pop this into my DVD player. You know what's funny is I watched wa- this movie on DVD like two years ago. Yes. Nice. And that means I also have the director's commentary... And the behind the scenes and all the special features that I can watch. Have, have and, you like, seen? Have wait, wait didn't knowledge. we watch that behind the scenes video on the train where it's just yeah, like did. the window with a yeah, yeah, sheet yeah. over it? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, dude, that's so hype now with the DVDs though. I can get that extra knowledge about exactly the films with the. Okay, um, let's do this top one hundred thing. Let's do this. Um, right. So yeah, we're gonna we're gonna read out today. Uh, our 100th favorite film mm-hmm. down to 91. Yes. Uh, and then next week we'll, we'll keep going. 10 each week. So are we going to do that at the um, end or the beginning? Um, uh, I say we keep it at the yeah, end. Yeah, I think this is a good bookmark. End. Yeah, yeah. Good bookmark. You got to listen through the podcast to get to this or, or you, you just, just skip, skip ahead. it. Yeah. That's true. Okay. Um, We'll also have the posted on our Instagram, but uh, how about we go one by one? Ben, what's your sure one hundred number favorite 100 movie? Is a legendary classic film, uh, "To Kill a Mockingbird." Um, oh, this film! This film came out in the early '60s, and I will say it's not the most entertaining viewing. But I just I don't know. This film is very important in cinema yeah. history broke a lot of ground because this this came out like pre-vietnam right in the civil rights movement uh and obviously if you haven't seen it or read the book i'm sure everybody's read the book in school uh but it's obviously the story of the uh this this white lawyer defending a black man against fabricated rape charges and it's just like one of my favorite courtroom courtroom drama films of all time i think it's really well done and uh i think it's a very important film and it's it just sneaks in sneaks into the hundred it's really well made for being in the 60s very very famous movie yeah i mean i think everyone's watched it in their english class robert duvall Um, got his start here as boo radley also which is cool yeah obviously he's been in the godfather and yep uh, tons of stuff tons of stuff that's a that's a good starting point. Yeah, yeah. To kill a mockingbird. Mm-hmm. Uh, my one hundredth favorite movie is Honey Boy. Ah. Uh, written direct or not directed, written by Shia LaBeouf. A film about Shia LaBeouf's life. Um, as a kid, being a child actor, coming from an abusive father. Um, this film is like the most disturbing coming of age film you will ever watch because you have to watch Shia LaBeouf play his own father and just it's it's very disturbing to think about the mindset he had to go through to make this movie um he wrote this film in rehab as a exercise for himself and then he decided this is pretty good so i'll make it into a movie uh we have mr lucas hedges in this film Mm. and i don't know it, it struck a chord with me i was like damn this is just so dark and beautiful and gritty but also just like really fantastic and some of the best child acting i've ever seen so uh honey boy number 100 there you go ben what's your 99 99 99 we got in bruges a martin oh mcdonough mcdonough <laughs> mcdonough market martin mcdonough you yeah it's it's a uh, ray fines colin farrell brendan gleason hilarious comedy yes sir super dark um yeah i just watched this one for the first time like a month ago maybe it's just it's a hilarious mm-hmm. dark comedy man really funny great performances yeah and uh yeah. yeah i think colin farrell is excellent 
definitely a must watch. Yes, he is. I haven't even seen the must billboards, watch, must but watch. like, I guess if you like that, also check this one out, and vice versa. Yes. Uh, yeah, just a, a good comedy here, in in my ninety really ninth spot. Fantastic dark comedy. My ninety ninth favorite film is In Bruges. Really. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is my 99th favorite film. Also, I had no clue. Well, you that know this what? Was even it was like higher 100. up until today because I put Boyhood on here. Spoiler alert. Look at that. Yeah, my 99th favorite film is In Bruges. Also, I love this film. It's so funny. Definitely one of the like funniest movies I've seen in a very long time. Mm-hmm. Um, great dark comedy. Yeah. Yeah, that actually you leads, pretty much said it that all. leads. Really well into my 98th favorite film, which is called Night on Earth, a Jim Jarmusch movie. This is a weird one, because it's, it's five short films as, like, an anthology. So it's five, like, 25-minute-ish scenes, in tax, like, all taking place in a taxi ride in different cities around the world. So in L.A., you have Winona Ryder as, like, this punk cab driver... Uh, Rosie Perez is in New York. And then there's some foreign language ones in France and Italy and Helsinki, Finland. And it's just, like, hilarious. And, uh, yeah, it's just really funny. And it's classic Jarmusch, so... If you're into the independent film movement of the 90s, check this one out. Or if you want to see a really young Winona Ryder, also check this one out. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, my 98th favorite film is a film I just watched two days ago called Oslo, August 31st. Oh. Um, it is a Norwegian film. Hmm. And it. Uh, it, is, it is about a recovering drug addict hmm. who gets leave from rehab for one day to go on a job interview. And it follows him through this one day, August 31st, in his town of Oslo. That's why it's called Oslo, August 31st. Right. Crazy. Um... <laughs> It, it was a really beautiful film. It has grown on me in the last two days, and I realized that it's kind of just fantastic. Um, the ending is so brutally crushing um, hmm. in the most nihilistic way possible, but fantastic. And, um, yeah, I mean, I don't think I've ever seen a Norwegian film before, and this was beautiful, beautiful, independent film. Hmm. Uh, 98th, 98th. Sweet. Uh, okay. Now, 97, right? Okay. Yep, uh, 97. At 97, we got The Pianist, which is Ooh, a Roman Polanski film. Adrian Brody is uh, a Jewish... Um, he's a Jewish pianist living in Poland right at the start. And you kind of... Okay, well, you see the journey from pre-Nazi occupation all the way as Adrian Brody becomes, like, a resistance fighter all the way to the end. Uh, This film has one of the most, like, legendary shots to me of Adrian Brody crying, walking through the empty streets. Of course, of course. Uh, So beautiful. I mean, this film is just, like, a really beautiful movie. I kind of boycott it now because, obviously, Roman Polanski is an awful person. Um, Oh, yeah. But still. He made a, a pretty good movie. And Adrian Brody gives one of he the did. best performances. He even won Best Director. Yeah. <laughs> even, though even though he couldn't come yeah, to the Oscar he's, uh, there. exiled there in uh, France or wherever. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, oh, yeah. Fantastic movie. Okay, my 97th film is an A24 film called Ex Machina. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I gotta see film. that one. Great film. Oscar Isaac, Dom Hall Gleason. Uh, this is, like, the most, like, philosophical film ever. It's, like, so, just, just, it's, it's deep. It's a deep movie. Mm. Uh, it's it's set in the near future, and it's basically set in one location the entire movie, but it's a very, very cool location. Um, and yeah, I, this film, one of my favorite A24 films, well, I think it's like tenth or something. There's a lot of A twenty four films on this list. Yeah. But um yeah. that's that's the first one there. That's the first one. I don't think I have any A twenty four films in my in my one hundred to ninety one range. But mm. yeah, there's plenty on this list. I have. Yeah. yeah. Okay. My ninety six 
is uh, the only Jed Apatow. Actually, it's not even Jed Apatow. It's Greg Matola. Super bad. Um, super bad. Super bad. Coming in at 96. This movie's hilarious. Uh, that's pretty much all it has going for it. I'm not going to lie. It's just hilarious. Um, oh, yeah. One of the most entertaining films of all yeah, time. Yeah, it's like, it's just funny. If you haven't seen this movie, you probably won't like it if you're over the age of, like, 25. Um, but, you know, it's it's a Jonah Hill uh, comedy. Michael Sarah's in it. Bill Hader, Seth Rogen, Emma Stone. Just that whole... And McLovin. Yeah, Christopher Mintz Plasse. I just bought McLovin socks online. I have super excited. bad socks that have McLovin's IDs on my on the. Top. Yeah, that's what I I just bought yeah, those. Stamp, just bought stamp those. socks. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, it's a hilarious movie, but you know it's not much more than that. So that's why it's like this low, even though I love it. I just. Yeah. I I don't have the heart to like put it above some of the other films on here. Mine is super bad. So high on my list. Oh my god. I love it, but I like can't bring myself <laughs> to call it better. I my I should address that my list isn't about quality of film. Yeah, it's about how much I, I, I like love the film. Super bad, but like I also love all the other films, and I'm just like That's you true. know what? That's fair. Super bad. I love you, but you're just not as good. <laughs> my ninety six film is kind of like Super Bad, a little different here. We got five hundred days of summer. Oh okay. Uh yeah, I haven't seen a it, but a a depressing rom-com mm-hmm. it's not even a rom-com it's about a desperate guy trying to get with this girl who just doesn't want a relationship and he's just depressed um joseph gordon lovett is hilarious in this movie and um yeah gives one of the best monologues uh of the decade mm-hmm. uh i don't know this film's just like it's really it's really just uh captures male desperation to be with a girl and just not 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 getting that not even close yeah but um i really love this movie uh it's kind of a comfort movie for me it's my 96 favorite yeah okay okay we're all we're halfway there we're halfway there okay let's, let's my uh, my number 95 is a film from last year one of the only ones on here i guess technically this year because it's a january release and it's uh judas and the black messiah um Ooh, this film i absolutely love the look of it uh i love the performances in it i think it's super entertaining i also think uh just the there needed to be uh a mainstream film about fred hampton and the black panther movement yeah. and uh i think yeah. that this film shaka king in his debut pretty much mm-hmm. um just directs it to a T. It's entertaining. It has a uh, great depiction of the the Black Panther movement, and yeah, it was one of my favorites. My like second favorite film from last year, that award season, and it's just sneaking in here at the bottom, ninety five. Nice. Um, my ninety five is another A twenty four film, uh, A twenty four horror film mm. called Green Room. Oh. Um, this is my favorite A24 horror film, even though they have quite a few, um, because it's just fun. You know, I love Hereditary, uh, I love The Lighthouse, I love Midsummer. well, I don't love, I like Midsummer, but, you know, Green Room, it's just fun. There's no deep meaning to it, it's not about that pretentious stuff, it's just about some, some, some punk band trying not to get killed by neo-nazis like that's that's the point of the film that's it um and it's just really fun really gruesome and like just a start to finish very entertaining watch nice. for anyone who likes a good horror movie or just like wants to see some gory blood and you got like an hour and a half of just needing to be entertained watch this movie because it will fulfill those that 90 minutes very thoroughly. Nice. Honestly, I think it's one of the most entertaining A2, A24 films. Sick. Um, out there. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I haven't seen that one yet. 94, I have Star Wars. But, okay. I, see, I, 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 I don't Wars. know. Like, I, Which Star Wars? Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> is To me, my favorite Star Wars is Empire Strikes Back. 
But when I made my original mm-hmm. list, I just put Star Wars on it because I thought for some reason it was the series. But like Star Wars on Letterboxd is a New Hope. Oh, oh, so interesting. Like, do you want to change it? No, to Empire I, I'm Strikes, just saying. Strikes I Strikes think that '94. I'm just putting the Star Wars series in general. <laughs> like, because <laughs> the original trilogy. Yeah, the original trilogy. Because okay. looking back, I just did like a marathon. I watched like so many dude i watched like everything and i watched all the ones in between like i watched rogue one all that stuff right yeah um and like the original trilogy is just still the best trilogy it's like so inventive and awesome but also looking back it's not as good technically as like you think it is when you're a kid like there's just some really bad green screen and stuff so to all the star wars fans bad special for all the star wars fans mad at me for putting it this low just know that star wars is like an essential part of my childhood but now i've grown out of that childhood and i realize you know what star wars just like isn't as amazing as i thought it was star wars is such an important part of my childhood but like they're not even close to these top 100 uh for me lord of the rings and harry potter are much more yeah, Lord of the Rings, uh, you'll be hearing my a lot about Lord of the Rings on my top 100. Well, you'll be hearing about it three yeah, times. Yeah, higher up, higher up. Yeah. Um, okay, Star Wars, the original trilogy, is Ben's 94th favorite film. Yes. Uh, my 94th favorite film is mid-90s, Jonah Hill's nice, nice. debut feature film. Uh, yeah. This is also a 24. Um, mm-hmm. I, yeah, like three in a row. I love this movie. I love this movie so much. It is like... A quintessential coming of age film mm-hmm. um i think it, it's one of the best uh directorial debuts in a very long time from jonah hill and i don't know this film like brought me to tears when i first watched it it's just totally. one of those movies that really captures teenage or tween kind of life um i love it fantastic movie yeah 93 ben taylor coming in we got hot fuzz uh, Ooh, an Edgar fun. Wright film from 2007, one of the most, like, outrageously funny movies I've seen. Like, this Edgar Wright is just a master of visual, visual storytelling and visual gags, visual comedy, all that stuff. And, like, this yeah. to me feels like just a more refined, like, vision than what Shaun of the Dead is. Because Hot Fuzz feels yeah. like now he has the money to, like, fully make a really good version of, like, that just, like, hilarious, yeah. over-the-top... It, it, it's kind of... It's weird, because, like, the the jokes are, the, are, like, how weird these cops are and how extreme they are. It's, like, stereotypes to the max. The, the, the description is big cops, small town, moderate violence. You know, it's it's like <laughs> hilarity in the normality of it all, I guess. It's not my yeah. favorite Edgar Wright film. There, I think two two are higher than it on my top 100, I think. Yeah. Right. But it's a really entertaining watch and one yeah. of his one of his best ones for sure. Hilarious. Uh, my 93rd is Atonement. Oh, we covered wow. this in great detail on the podcast. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, yeah I uh, atonement cool I'm not even gonna go into detail here because we did an hour and a half long thing about Jeez, this movie that was so um long. yeah back in the old days when we had long well long I mean days. this one's gonna be pretty um, long because we're doing this top 100 thing yeah I'm gonna cut it down I'm gonna edit it down sure uh but yeah atonement fantastic movie I don't know it's just beautiful. Like, yeah. I don't even know if it's, like... It's just beautiful. It's just great. It's just Eye straight candy. Up gorgeous looking. All right. Yeah. 92, Ben Taylor... Ben Taylor's list. We got, uh... We got Boys in the Hood. This movie is nice. awesome. I love Boys in the Hood. Uh... Yeah. Came out in 91. Lawrence Fishburne, Ice Cube, uh... Cuba Gooding Jr. I mean, this film is just, like really entertaining it's hilarious it's heartbreaking um and it's just once again a very important film uh 
about gang violence and all the, uh, just poverty, black poverty in general in South Central LA. Great watch. Came out in, yeah, 91. Super important. Go check it out. Boys in the Hood. Boys in the Hood. My 92nd favorite film is The Perks of Being a Wallflower. Mm. Um, we reviewed this not too long ago. Yeah. Uh, another kind of comfort film for me. Kind of like 500 Days of Summer. Comforting in a very depressing way. Love Perks of Being a Wallflower. The ending will always just make me happy. Very, very happy. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. All right. Number 91. Uh, capping off our first 10 for me is Call Me By Your Name yeah. at number 91. Ooh, nice. This Call film, Me By Your Name. This film is on our wheel, I believe, so we might have a chance to do a full episode about it. Uh, but obviously, yes. ev- I mean, everyone's seen this movie. You got a romance between everybody's uh, crush's favorite boy. Everyone's boy. Timothy, Timothy Chalamet and and the Mr. Cannibal, Cannibal himself, Army Hammer. Army Hammer. Uh, Too soon, but we're gonna make that joke. Yeah, it's about a seventeen-year-old falling in love with his dad's assistant. It's kind of weird and creepy if you think about it. Definitely kind of creepy. Yeah, especially but... since Army Hammer is a cannibal. <laughs> oh, <laughs> God, dude! <laughs> like, I don't want to rewatch this now. Dude, I... <laughs> It's going to be so <laughs> weird. Like... Oh, the peach scene. <laughs> oh, no. Um, uh, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I I love Call Me By It's a great too. film. It's a little higher it's up an, on my list. It's an list. amazing indie film. Great romance. And obviously it gave mm-hmm. us our boy, Timothy Chalamet. Timothy got nominated for the Oscar yeah. up against I remember that year so well. He was up against like some of the greatest actors of all time. It was Denzel Washington, <laughs> Gary Oldman, uh Daniel Day Lewis, and Timothy Chalamet, and there was another one that I was like, oh my god, this poor child. <laughs> but um yeah. My ninety first is the Wolf of Wall Street. Hmm. Um We've also reviewed this film. Wolf of Wall Street. I love this movie. Yeah. It's fun. It's entertaining. Uh, it's the first film that we have entered the four and a half star territory on my list. So as you can see, my list is mainly four and a half stars and then the final 16 or five stars. But, um, dude, yeah, I don't even know where Street. you enter four and a half star territory for me. I don't think it's up until later. It's, it's after yeah, Boyhood. I think it's at around 75 half. where you enter four and a half star territory for me. Interesting, interesting. I don't know. Yeah. It's just kind of the way it The Wolf out. of Wall Street. I uh, I love this movie. It's very entertaining. Leonardo DiCaprio, one of his best performances. Uh, yeah, we... Awesome. So, cool. there you have it. Those are our first 10 out of our top 100, uh, 100 to 91. Mm-hmm. Uh, ben and I are obviously going to watch many movies in the next 10 weeks. And probably this list is going to change but the list we are going to continue telling you about is the list as it is right now yeah right now um and we will we will take note if things change we'll let you know if we watch movies that get into the top 100 but the list we will be sharing on instagram and on this podcast is the list as it is right now Correct. um you can check our instagram and there will be a post about both of these both of our lists uh yeah But that pretty much wraps up this podcast. Yeah. All right. We will see you guys next week with the review of the Grand Budapest Hotel and also our 90th to 81st favorite films. Uh, Yeah. Well, we'll see you guys next week. Thank you for listening to Slightly Qualified Film Students. Make sure to tune in next week for a new film discussion and review. Our theme song is Slightly Sexy by Thompson Springs. Make sure to subscribe and leave us a like. Send us feedback and comments as well as your thoughts on the film. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at S underscore Q underscore F underscore S. If you would like to send us a question or a comment for next week's episode, you can email us at sqfilmstudents at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you all next week. Bye.